Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar by MBF Bioscience. I'm Sue Tappan, staff scientist here at MBF. I run the day-to-day -day operations at our contract research facility, MBF Labs, so I use Neuralusta and Stereo Investigator every day. I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Julie Korich. Thank you, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm also a staff scientist at MBF, but one of my main responsibilities is to travel to different labs to install and train researchers like you on how to use MBF software. Today we're offering you a sneak peek of our upcoming version 11 release. We'll be using our soon to be released version to demonstrate many of the features that you can use to great advantage when presenting your data. We hope that these tools will be helpful as you prepare your next manuscript, post a presentation for SFN, journal club meeting, or conference talk. So grab your popcorn and let's get started. That's right. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view later. A link to the webinar will be sent to you in an email. If you would like a certificate of completion for attending this webinar, please let us know in the question window and we'll provide one to you. All questions and answers will be available on our website, even if they are not answered live. The key to a successful webinar is your questions, so let's go over how to send them to us. The GoToWebinar control panel is visible on your monitor, along with our presentation here. It will automatically close into the upper right-hand corner of your screen during the presentation. To submit questions to us, simply click the orange arrow button to open the GoToWebinar control panel. Find the question tool panel, type question in box, and click send. And so we're going to get started. So because this is um, a webinar about working with images and generating publication quality images and figures, we're going to start by talking about working with images in image stacks in Neurolucida and Stereo Investigator. Now these images and image stacks could have been captured with one of our systems, so inside of Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida, or they could also have been captured on a third-party microscope system. Like a two-photon or confocal scope. Yes, exactly. So maybe in your core facility that's not linked with MBF software. And so first, we're going to talk about the image adjustment. So typically, when you first load an image into our software, you may need to adjust it. And so to do any adjustments, you'll go to Image, Image Adjustment. And this dialog will appear. In this dialog, you can adjust the dynamic range of the image, so the, white, the dark point or the white point to help make items pop or make uh, the signal a bit brighter. You can also adjust the brightness and contrast of the image. Now in this example here, we actually have a multi-channel image. And so there's three channels, uh, red, green, and blue. And you can choose to ungroup the color channels so you can view each channel separately. Now, if you had this unchecked, you would just only be able to adjust the brightness and contrast for all three channels. When you ungroup, you're able to adjust the brightness, the contrast, the dark point, the white point, the gamma for each channel separately. So it gives you a bit more control. Now, if you've loaded in multiple images into Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida that you need to modify to now put into your publication, you can just load them all in. And any, if you check this option to apply any changes to images checked in the organizer, then any changes made will be across the board. So this can help you stay consistent if you're manipulating images from different groups or different animals. The last two things I want to talk about for these checkboxes is you can also apply changes to a stack. So any changes you make could be applied to the full stack, or you could adjust a single image plane within that stack by just unchecking this option that's grayed out. Now finally, what we want to do is, is talk about changing what you see displayed. And so say, for instance, I really don't want to see the red channel. All I have to do is uncheck the checkbox under display next to red, and I'll only see the green and blue channels, which is nice. So you can toggle between the channels. You can display red. You can display green. You can display blue. And you can save accordingly. But what if, what if you're making an image and blue has a terrible contrast with black? Yes, which can happen, which does happen. And so what you could actually do is click on the color swatch, Sue, and that will bring up a color palette and you can choose a new color. So for instance, I can make blue white. Look at that. And there's much more contrast here. So maybe you want to go through and, and change the colors to make things pop, what you're trying to visualize pop. 
Okay, so now once you've created the adjustments to the image so that it's pleasing for the presentation image you're looking to create, a next common thing that you're going to want to do is add some scale bars so that you know how big these particular objects are. In version 11, we have dramatically changed how you can add scale bars so that you can now modify them and place them at any location in your image or embed them into the image itself. So previously in version 10 and previous, the scale bar was a part of the image itself. Now we can specify not only the, the color, the size, and the location of the image, but we can choose whether or not to add it to the image itself. So to demonstrate that, we'll go to Neuralucida. And I'll bring in an image. So I'm going to bring in my image. And it's currently displayed at the proper resolution. To add a scale bar, I'll go to Edit, Add Scale Bar. You can set the color. So you can choose the color of the scale bar that you'd like, black, white, aqua. <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> I'm going to choose white and uh, select the proper scale. So this is a 40x image, so I prefer to use a 25 micron scale bar. And now I will click the location of the scale bar. If I want to modify that, I can um, select the object just like I would a branch or contour, any other tracing object, and now I can move it around. So I could be in the right-hand corner. I could select it and move it to the left-hand corner. Can you change the color after the fact? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you want to change the color, you can, uh, you'll can. select the right-click option to change scale bar settings. And now, oh, cool. let's make it aqua. <laughs> and we have a lovely aqua scale bar. If um, right now, if we want to add that to the, um, make it a part of the image so that we can now save the image with the scale bar attached, you'll select the right click option to embed it into the image. Otherwise, you can keep it separate and so it sort of floats. It's a tracing object. And so you can use this option here to keep the scale bar on screen. So if you're bringing in multiple 40x images and you need to have the scale bar show up in the same location for each of those images, that's one way to make it quick and easy to do so. So another um, feature that is common that you're going to want to do is create a different image from the image that you have. Mm -hmm. So n we're not talking about just changing the the image adjustments of the brightness of the contrast, but maybe you want to provide a maximum intensity projection or a single plane from your image stack. And that's what you want to create your figure from. And so in order to do that, um, let me bring in an image stack. And it'll load with scaling. And so here's my image stack. And now if I want to um, display the maximum intensity projection, you would go to image, maximum intensity projection. And so you can see now for a fluorescent image, all the brightest pixels rise to the top. And now you see all of all of the brightest pixels together throughout the image stack. If you want to create an image of that, it's image stack max projection save as, and it writes it to a file. Excellent. What would you do if it was a bright field image stack? You would use the minimum intensity projection okay. so that you bring the darkest pixels to the top. Great. Another option that you may want to do, I'm going to turn off the maximum intensity projection. We may want to crop the image to show only a certain portion of this image. So to crop an image stack, you select the option Image, Crop Image, and it recognizes that we have an image stack loaded and selected in the image organizer. And we can determine what region of the section we want, or region of the image stack we want cropped. And we can select 
to either replace the original image or create a new one. Personally, I'm a little terrified of overwriting my image data, so I always, <laughs> yeah, I'm too. <laughs> I always uh, leave the original and create a new one. Yeah, you don't want to lose the original. No. If you want to only crop the individual image plane that you're viewing at the time, you can also do that. So you're going to select crop, and right now, this is what I'm left with. And so now I can toggle through the stack, and you can see by using page up and page down that I have created a new image stack of just a portion of the original image stack. Great. So that's a very handy feature. And then you can just go and save that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You, yep. So you can save it if you want. Um, and, and then it's available for use. When you crop an image, it keeps the scaling. And that's a wonderful feature so that if you wanted to only perform analyses on this smaller subregion of your image stack, um, the scaling is still right. held in memory or uh, retained with the image, this new image that you've generated. Another thing you may want to do when you have a multi-channel um, image or image stack is write out the individual channels. So you may want only the red channel or only the green channel or or the fifth channel if you've got more than three channels. And, and so in that case, it's very simple to do. You can just do image save as and you'll have the option when the when the dialog comes up to export the image file when you do that you'll select that checkbox and then select save as individual channels and now you can see here as an example that this original image which was a three channel image I wrote out as the channel one channel two channel three Okay, and I already showed you how to um, select and save a portion of the image, and that's image, crop image, and remember, scaling is preserved, so that's um, fabulous. MBF offers um, file formats that allow you to store your adjustments um, at the time of acquisition and any image adjustments that you make um, later on separately from the image itself. And Photoshop and other software programs may not correctly interpret this information. And so when you have that sort of situation, you may have a beautiful image in Neuralusta when you open that file, but when you take that file into Photoshop, it may be a different color or um, the, the contrast may be incorrect and doesn't match what you see when you just open the same exact file in Neuralusta. So what we recommend is that you make your adjustments to the image, not at the time of acquisition. So keep your camera histogram with that full dynamic range. And then in the image adjustment window, after you've acquired the image, make the necessary adjustments to have the display be what is appropriate for the picture or story that you're trying to tell. Great. So now that we've wrapped up working with images and image stacks in Stair Investigator Neurolucida, we're going to talk about working with the tracing data. By tracing data, we're talking about neurons that you reconstructed, so dendrites and axons, contours that you trace to delineate different regions of interest, markers you place to mark particles or cells or varicosities. And so we're going to start by changing tracing colors. So if you know that you're going to generate a reconstruction of a neuron or a region of interest, and you plan on exporting it into a publication, into a manuscript, you can select the colors that you want prior to tr tracing. And you do that under Options, Display Preferences, select the Neuron, the Marker, or the Contour tab. So we're going to start first with our neuron. How this is set up is we initially default to trace each tree or each dendrite or axon, we call them trees, as a separate color. So tree one would be this color, tree two would be that color. And you could also have it set to color by branch order. And what that would entail was the first segment would be this kind of pukey green color. Mm -hmm. The next color would be lavender. The next segment, excuse me, would be lavender, so on and so forth. So the second order branch. Julie, so I don't like pukey green. I don't like pukey green either. So if you don't like pukey green, you can just click on this color swatch and select the color you like. Maybe you want white. Maybe you want red. You could select that instead. Um, we also have these preset colors, bright or dark, that hopefully would be a, a set of colors that will be helpful for you to trace whatever type of, of neuron that you're trying to reconstruct. 
So if you're working with a fluorescent monochrome image, you could select a palette that doesn't include white. Exactly, because that would be problematic. I used to trace like that, and it's hard. If you're trying to trace white on white, it's really hard to see what you're doing. <laughs> it looks like you're already done, though. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Makes it easy. No. Um, you can also uh, show your nodes, and we call a node a branch point. And so you can change the size of the node or the node style closed or open. Um, we'll talk about filling in cell bodies in the next slide. Now, if we talk about our markers, we can change the marker name to be specific for the cell type that we're working with. Um, we can also click on the symbol to change the color. So if we don't want our little X to be fuchsia, we could change it to whatever color we want. Um, now, in terms of marker sizing, you can also change the size of the markers. And so these would be markers that I've placed on my, on my dendrite. So I can show the markers in pixels or in microns, and so you might want to make them a little bit bigger if you're going to export this and you really want the markers to pop. You could also use this intrinsic mode, and this is going to allow you to actually modify the size of the markers you place depending on what it is that you're marking. Let me show you what I mean by that. So in this image, I'm actually going to load in a different, now I guess I could use this cropped image. So here's my cropped image. If I wanted to go ahead, I'm going to zoom in just so you can see. The image will get pixelated, but we're really talking about markers right now, and I want to make sure everyone can see. But this is my marker toolbar. I can go and select a marker. Say that I'm trying to just, I want to mark these synapses. I mean, sorry, these spines. So I can just roll my mouse wheel, and let me make sure before I do that, let me go into Options, Display Preferences. <laughs> we didn't check. Markers, and we're already in intrinsic mode. So I just roll my mouse wheel to map the diameter of the head of the spine that I'm marking. And I can mark it. Now say I had a smaller one, or I want to mark a smaller particle. Now I roll the cursor diameter to match that so it's a little bit smaller. So you can go through and you can change the size of the marker that you're marking. Now say, for instance, you didn't like these markers because they're solid spheres. You could always go up to the editing tool and you can do the same thing for neurons that you trace or contours. And I can draw a marquee around all of these. Right click, so they're selected. Right click and I can change the marker type. So I can make these open circles if that's a little bit easier for me to see what I'm trying to visualize. So you have a lot of flexibility. What if you were using this intrinsic marker style to mark different spine types. Could you combine that with different markers as well? You could. We also have a spine toolbar that's grayed out now because we're in marker mode, but you could also mark spines as spines, and we have different classes. And so now the last thing we want to do is say, for instance, that I had hundreds of markers placed, and I decided when I was going to export this into my presentation that white really wasn't the right color. What I can do is go back into Edit, Select Objects, pick just one of those markers. So I don't have to pick all thousand of them or hundred of them. Right click, and now I can also say, set everything, select everything this color. So it's going to go through and select all of those hundred markers. Now I could do another right click and change the color. And that's regardless of type. So if exactly. you had contours, you had yep. markers. Exactly. So now select I can, everything white. And now I could pick another color, and voila. All of my markers now will be the same color. So if I have markers across sections and it's getting complicated, I just have to pick one, and I could select then all of them that are that color. Mm -hmm. um, and now in terms of, let's go back. OK, so now contours, the same thing that you can do with markers. You can change the contour name to match the anatomical region that you're delineating. Um, you can also change the color of the contours. And so now we're going to talk about filling in this cell body. So a lot of times when you're trying to export a neuronal reconstruction, you want to export it with a filled-in soma. So you want it to look something like this as opposed to this where we have a bunch of lines traced throughout the, the volume of the soma. And so you want it to be a nice solid structure because it's going to look nicer in display. So if you traced these, this soma as a series of cell body traces, and you do that under the trace menu, manual neuron tracing, you can just go into options, display preferences, and click the option to fill cell bodies. And what you're left with is this. Now, if you had traced these as contours, 
you can use the editing tool, edit, select objects, draw a marquee around those contours, do a right click and set, select the option to set to cell body. When you do that and you go into options display preferences, when you fill, you'll see a nice solid structure. So that's just kind of a handy trick just to make the Soma look solid. I tend to do that as a matter of course. So in Neurolucida, I have it set up to have the display preference set to fill cell bodies so that I can easily tell just when I load a reconstruction if these contours need to be changed to a cell body. Oh, that's a great idea. Okay, so now Sue's going to talk about scale bars, texts, and arrows. That's right. So in version 11, we've added this ability to add a scale bar not only to images, but now just to your reconstruction. So if you only want the reconstruction to be your figure for your manuscript, you can add your scale bar only to the trace data because we've made the scale bar a tracing element rather than a part of the image. And so I'll show you how to add the scale bar for tracings, annotate, and add arrows as well. So I'm going to clear and start with a new data file and bring in my reconstruction. This reconstruction was um, great, uh, generously provided by Bob Jacobs and I appreciate that. This is a giraffe visual cortex neuron. And you can see that uh, we have um, the tracing created so that each tree is a different color and uh, lots of markers that indicate the position of dendritic spines along each of these branches. My, my soma is filled. And so we're nearly there for creating a publication quality image. So the next thing that I need to do is add a scale bar so that I can compare this visual cortex neuron from the giraffe against maybe an elephant hmm. cortical neuron. Those are some big animals you're reconstructing. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Jacobs does a lot of really cool stuff. Okay, so now we need to provide a, a proper scale bar and aqua is fine. You can um, show the label and the units if you'd like. So I'm going to select that I'd like the scale bar to appear here. And I can move it around if I want. I'm gonna so just like you did for the image. Oh, sure. Yep, mm -hmm. it behaves exactly the same way. Great. Um, I'm going gonna, gonna to add a... Oops. I'm going to add text. I'm going to say this is where, when we were recording, this is where the stimulus was applied. I'll set the font. It's set to four. Oh, that's really small. Can we fix that? Yep. So you go into edit, either under edit, select objects, or um, the shortcut is to select the white arrow icon. Um, when you do that, you get the editing tool in Neurolucida. And I've got stimulus selected. I can change the font. Now let's make it 10. Oh, much better. Yeah. So let's move it over here and add an arrow to indicate where we applied the stimulus. OK, so I'd like to edit the arrow as well to show only the arrowhead. And just for consistency's sake, again, I'm using all the right-click options here to change the arrow to aqua as well. You can drag a point, either the head or the um, tail of the arrow, to um, rotate it or um, change the apparent size. And now we have a neuronal reconstruction with arrows, um, text if desired, as well as uh, a scale bar. So this is all very well and good, but um, this is how the, the neuron actually appeared at the time of reconstruction. Oh, so on the tissue slide. Mm -hmm. And that isn't necessarily the story I want to tell when I create a um, figure. Maybe instead what I'd like to do is have apical point up. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. Yep. So it's very straightforward to do. In the editing tool, we're going to select all the points, including the text and the scale bar. And now we're going to rotate the um, objects by selecting rotate objects from the right click menu. 
and this bullseye is the um, pivot point. And so you can set that anywhere you want. And then once you have it holding down the left mouse button, you can spin your dendrite and or your whatever is selected to the appearance that you want. So now That's you can great. see that everything spun appropriately. The text is upright, even though before it was upright on its side. And so everything has been adjusted appropriately. Great. And so now that you've rotated the tracing, you've maybe added your scale bars, your annotations, now you want to export that. So how do we do that? You go to File, Export Tracing. And this option will come up. You have a few choices. You can export as a vector graphic. And that's going to allow you to load this into a program such as Adobe Illustrator. And that allows for smooth scaling and further manipulation. So the markers will look appropriate. The, the trees will look appropriate. The contours will look, look appropriate. If you do have images in addition to the tracing data, you can choose to include those in the export. You can also choose to export it in monochrome. So I don't actually have to go through and select all of these trees and make them black if I want to export them as black on a white background. Right. So that comes in handy. Now, if you want to export it as an image, you're going to load it directly into um, you know, PowerPoint or into a Word document for your figure, then you can export it as an image. You can set the pixels, the background. You can choose to have the current view only, or if this reconstruction extended Outside your field of view, if you uncheck this, it will make sure it, it exports the entire thing, not just what's in your field of view. Again, if you have image data, you can choose to export the image data in addition to the tracing data. And you can export in monochrome. So in this example, I'm going to export as an image, set the background to white, check monochrome, and this image becomes this image. And so it's really easy to, to export, too. So you don't actually have to go through and change all the individual tree colors. You could just export in monochrome. And you know this is typically what you'll see in a publication, You know, mm -hmm. black neurons on a white background. Yep. OK, so now we're going to talk about working with images and traces. So we're combining the image stuff that we just talked about with the tracing stuff that we worked talked about because a lot of times you're working with both at the same time. And this is an example of that, where the dendrites have been traced using AutoNeuron, which is actually our module for automatic neuronal reconstruction. The spines were actually traced using AutoSpine, which is our automatic module for automatic spine detection. This all could have been done manually, but we took advantage of our automatic tools to generate this, this gorgeous reconstruction. For now, we're going to talk about displaying the thickness of dendritic fibers or axonal fibers that you trace. And so if we look down at my image, what I've done, and we go back to the previous slide, what I've done is when I traced or when this, this dendrite was traced, the thickness was mapped. If this is done in auto neuron, this is done automatically. But if you're manually reconstructing this neuron, you can actually map the thickness of the dendrite as you go. And so to view that thickness, if you went ahead and, and did the thickness measurements, is you go to Options, Display Preferences, select the View tab, and check the Display Thickness option. Or you could click this icon on the toolbar. So let's just show you what that means. And then we're going to talk about tracing transparency. And I'll talk about that when I'm in Neurolucida. So let me just load in my DAT file that I want to work with for this. And so this is just showing the thickness in addition to, and so we're just showing the thickness of, of this tracing. And so if I wanted to hide the tracing, all I have to do is just uncheck this little icon that just says display thickness. So I can turn this off and on. I just loaded in a DAT file. I didn't load in the image, but you could have also done that. Now, if I wanted to adjust this thickness of this trace, one thing I can do is I can do some editing. So if I made a mistake and the thickness wasn't exactly accurate, all I have to do is go up to Edit, Select Objects. I can pick my tree, and I can choose to adjust the whole thickness of the entire tree that mm -hmm. I've traced. I can also go ahead and select individual points. So let's zoom in a little bit. And actually, I want to zoom in a bit more. 
And if I select these individual points, now I can actually select individual points along my dendrite or my axon. So the one that's more highlighted or, or bold is Larger. the one that's going to be selected. So now I can adjust the thickness of just that point along my tree. If I want, I could draw a marquee, and all of the points within my marquee would be selected, so I could adjust those as a unit. I can also select points that are not adjacent by holding down the shift key, and now I can adjust those points. And so you have a lot of flexibility after you've d traced um, a dendrite with thickness to go back and modify that. So there's always our software, there's always editing that can be done to make the, the tracing that you export and the images that you export proper for what it is you're trying to display in your presentation. Now let's talk about the transparency. So I'm actually going to show a different data file where we actually have the image data. Oh yeah, so if you're loading in your dat file and you're thinking to yourself, why don't I see my image data? This is called user error. <laughs> we all make it, even those of us who have been at MBF for almost seven years. And we're like, what is happening? But if you load in your DAT file and you don't see the image data, check that you have this option to load images with data file before you freak out, like we did a little bit. Um, so you just make sure that's checked. So this is going to happen. This is great when this stuff happens, because you're going to do the exact same things. But so not anymore, because we told you. <laughs> so now I actually have my image data. Yay! And so you can see if I step through, I can actually hide my um, tracing. And I go and show my max projection that I have my image data. OK. So now what I can also do is I can adjust the transparency of this. So if you're having a hard time as you're tracing thickness or visualizing the image data underneath the tracing data, all you have to do is go up to Options, Display Preferences again. So this is a common theme, Options, Display Preferences. Um, that's why it's good we're doing this, because this is one of those menu topics that a lot of users don't know about. But if I go to my View tab, this is also where I can display thickness. I was using the icon. But here I could also adjust the tracing transparency. And you can see how now the tracing is more transparent. So I can start to see the image data underneath. Mm -hmm. And you know, I usually like to turn this on adjust the transparency if I am manually tracing the dendrite with thickness. It really helps me make sure that I'm mapping the thickness properly. OK. Well, let me make sure that I keep that fully opaque for some of our other demos that are going to be coming up. OK. And so now what we're going to talk about is creating screenshots. I use these all the time for in Stereo Investigator to mm -hmm. demonstrate what to count, what the probe does, what it looks like when you're actually in process. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very handy way to actually demonstrate the intricacies of stereology in a very simple and easy to yep. view way. This is more probably for the Stereo Investigator users. The, what we were showing before is more probably for the Neurolucida users. So we're going to switch gears and load Stereo Investigator now. And what I'm going to do here is just load in an image that I'm going to do the Cavalieri probe on. OK, so here is that um, uh, multi-channel montage that I was working with earlier with my image adjustments. Yep, Chip Gerfin made this image. Yes, so we'd like to thank him for providing this image for us to use in these, in these uh, webinars and in our seminars. Um, so I'm just going to launch the Cavalieri probe. So if I just go to probes, Cavalieri, and this is the volume probe. So this is a, a way to quantify volume for those of you who aren't familiar with stereology. I'm going to pick a marker, and I'm just going to mark in the, in the hippocampus. So quickly mark. And now I want to demonstrate where I did my marking, so how I got this volume measurement, where I did my, my sampling. And so I could just make a screenshot of this. I just go up to Tools, Screenshot. And if I look in my image organizer, I have my screenshot that's available that I can now save. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't going to save scaling. This is more just a visualization to display the probe that you use for your sampling, maybe where you sampled. And it can be helpful in a presentation if you're talking to people who really aren't familiar with stereology. It's a lot, a lot of times easier to see an image 
as opposed to you just talking. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words, so they like to say. Yeah. Um, now, also, you do sometimes want to make sure that the markers you place or the grid that we see here is in colored, the probe is colored in a way that is easy to visualize. So we know how to change the markers under Options Display Preferences, but to change the... Um, the grid, so the stereology probe, you go to option stereology preferences. Under color and tick marks, you can change the color of the probe. Under counting frame, you can change the color of your counting frame. That would be for our optical fractionator users, those who mm -hmm. are doing cell counts. So this can be a really handy way to... So to just show. for giggles, change the color of the tick marks to our favorite aqua, maybe. <laughs> I really don't like aqua, well. but I do what I'm told. <laughs> Never. And there you go. And so mm -hmm. now they're aqua. Yep. But if we look at our, if we get out of the probe, you can see that the screenshot captured what was on the screen at the time that the image was, was taken. If you are trying to create a screen snapshot of a counting frame while you're counting, you need to snap a picture. So you need to acquire an image and then do the screen snapshot if you're doing anything live, whether it's um, tracing thickness in a Golgi image in Neurolucida or um, overlaying a counting frame and selecting an individual object. One other point to help with clarity, if you are doing a counting frame um, image for a figure or for your talk, I like to ensure that I'm only showing one marker in my in my counting frame. So you may have a counting frame where you've got a beautiful cell, but you've already counted that dissector and there's three other cells in there as well. Um, for the purpose of the image, you might want to instead um, hide the other markers, snap your picture, and then unhide them for um, to carry on. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Now, all the export features that we've been talking about in Neurolucida are available in Neurolucida Explorer. So for those of you who are not familiar with Neurolucida, uh, Neurolucida is where you're going to do your neuronal reconstructions and anatomical reconstructions. Neurolucida Explorer is where you get the morphometric data from those reconstructions. All the numbers. All the numbers. But we did add finer control of color and display properties for things like the shoal analyses or analyses like the shoal analysis. The shoal analysis puts concentric rings around your neuronal reconstruction. And you can color these concentric rings and then export that using file export, export image. So you can change those colors in addition to the dendrites and the axons. Polar histograms, which is uh, length as a function of direction, you can change the color that you see displayed. Same, in, same for fan-in diagrams, which is a similar analysis to polar histogram. You can change the color of these fibers. Dendrograms, you can also change the color of the font as well as the color of each one of these trees. Yep. So a dendrogram is going to display each tree, and then it's kind of branching segmentation. So this first branch would be the first order branch, these two would be the second order branches. Yeah, it's regardless of position. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of where it goes in Z, you now just, it's a, a easy way to see flat out where everything is going and how big it is. Okay, so now let's switch gears. Um, early on, Maria wanted to know how to deal with these large virtual slides she's able to do of the human brain. She's creating coronal sections of frontal lobes, and she's able to create these gorgeous images in Stereo Investigator, but other software programs can't handle those images. So what is she to do when she needs to create her publication mm -hmm. um, image for her manuscript? Well, the good news is that um, there, all the features that we talked about are available when you're looking working with really large images. Um, we just have to go about them in a different way. So what I mean by large images are images that are generally larger than a single field of view need special accommodations to handle how big they are. So this includes 2D and 3D virtual slides, uh, mosaics, and image montages. And you can tell whether or not you're in that designation by looking in the image organizer when you have show details checked. If you see virtual image mode here in parentheses, then you know that the software has loaded, accommodated this very large image, and so options to create the um, maximum projection or other features are going to um, operate in a different way. 
if your computer is, has sufficient RAM, we may be able to adjust some of the memory requirements that is used when loading images to help um, make things savvier. Uh, it is an option that wholly depends on what your computer is set up to do as well as what you're trying to do, how big the images are that you're actually using. So contact us and we'll be happy to check it out and, and walk you through the best best plan for your particularly large images. So these large images, you can create them and in virtual image mode, you can create screen snapshots, scale bars, annotations, arrows, and export tracing. All of those are done exactly the same way as what we talked about previously. Some other features are modified for these very large montages. Um, you can still create them, but you're going to um, generate those images in a different way. Image processing is not permitted on images that cannot be held in memory because that's a very memory intensive operation and in order to manipulate the images for those types of situations we need more um, space than is capable when, when the image is too big and so that's just not permitted at the current time. So I'd like to walk you through how to um, create these derivative images. So this includes the maximum intensity projection, um, creating a single plane from a stack, and loading individual channel, channel data. All of those are simply, it's just in a, a different menu option. So I'm going to go to Stereo Investigator. I'm going to actually use this image. This will work fine, but I'm going to get rid of the screen snapshot. And I'm going to delete the markers because I don't need them right now. So in this case, this is a good example. So here's my image organizer. This is a very large tiled montage that was generated of the entire coronal section of this mouse brain captured at 10x. So many 10x images were stitched together to create this image. And so it's very large and it is held in virtual image mode. All you need to know is that when this is in parentheses, you have different options for how you're going to create your different setups. So the first thing you may want to be able to do is take this image to Photoshop, but it is too big to be read by Photoshop. The first thing you can do is under Image Save As, you can save a part of this image. And so it will save whatever is displayed in the field of view right now at a resolution of your choice. So you can decide how big a file you want to create. And generally, the issue with Photoshop is that it just can't handle an image that is too big, too many pixels. So we can change um, the resolution to something that's smaller, but still retains enough resolution for the purpose for which you're creating the image. So you select it, and you'll be able to create a partial image of your um, full screen. If instead you want to create a partial image of just a portion of your very large montage, say the hippocampus here, if you do a screen snapshot, the, it, the image may turn out pixelated. So instead, you can zoom in and select File, Image, Save As, and now it's going to create an image of just this region here. And this is um, OK. And so when we load in that image, you can see that it shows up and it's not pixelated. And so this is what you're typically looking to be able to do with these very large images is you may want to be able to create this type of image where you can go to Photoshop, to Word, to PowerPoint and have that available to you. You can add, um, as we demonstrated before, you can add scale bars. Um, you could do a screen uh, overlay if you then wanted to create a screen snapshot to demonstrate a probe. All of that stuff is now available to you. 
if your image is held in memory, you have the option to change the pixel dimensions. So this allows you to specify how much, how many pixels are provided in the image in a different way than when it's in virtual image mode. So that's just an option for you if, um, if it can be held in memory, but it, it's still too big for your purposes. Yep, too big for Photoshop. Too big for Photoshop or wherever or else Word, you're loading it. Wherever yeah. you're taking it. And so in this case, here's an example from Gwen Crabb. She's got um, six images, stacks actually, that are um, put together in an image montage. And we wanted to change the pixel dimensions so that we could um, create a nice figure for export. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way to do it. Great. So now we're going to um, talk about working with 3D data. So the last eight minutes or so, we're going to show you how to make movies. Yay! This is my favorite thing in the world to do. Well, favorite thing in the software to do. What we're going to talk about here is how to take that image data, how to take that tracing data, and make a movie so you can put it into your publication or presentation. To do that, you use the 3D visualization tool. This is going to be found in both Stare Investigator and Neurolucida. This doesn't require a separate module. It's built into the software. And so this will display 3D renderings of objects built from anatomical regions of interest in neurons. And this is mainly for visualization and potentially validation. Um, you can rotate and zoom, place a skin around a wireframe and adjust the transparency, display image and tracing data simultaneously. You can save a certain view as a TIFF or JPEG 2000 or create movies. So we're going to now switch over to um, Neurolucida and we're going to do some um, 3D vid stuff. And I'm going to start with that um, 3D uh, brain reconstruction. So this is, this is actually a 3D reconstruction we did of, of the brain. And so if I just open up my 3D viz, so tools 3D visualization, this is in individual image stacks where we've gone through and outlined the different regions of interest we were interested in reconstructing. You could also create this data live under the microscope by using the 3D serial section reconstruction module. Mm -hmm. And so however you create that data, once you then have the data structure, you can bring it into 3D visualization to do all sorts of fabulous things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I just zoomed in. And by zooming in, I just did a right click and selected zoom. And then I pushed the mouse away from me and I can zoom in and that helps you guys see this a little bit easier. So under my, I have a number of tabs, under my tracing tab, I mean sorry, under my contours, I can select contours and hit options and I can put a surface reconstruction over these um, contours to make a skin. I can now remove the trace contour so it's a nice skin that I see and now I can show the solid view which is what we have displayed or the wireframe. I'm partial to the solid view and then I can cap the ends, so I can cap those, those very first contours that were traced. I can also smooth the data if I choose by enabling the smooth function and sliding the slider. Texture we'll talk about when I show the next example. Now with transparency, I have multiple contours here. So if I adjust the transparency of all of the contours like I have selected, everything becomes transparent, which isn't overly helpful. So what we've done is we allow you to select an individual contour to adjust the transparency. So I can adjust one of the hemispheres. <laughs> the ugly one. The ugly one. The one that wasn't traced as accurately as the other side. I didn't mean to say ugly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't do the reconstruction, so it's okay. I didn't either. I made the movie, so as long as we like the movie. And now I can adjust the transparency of the surface so I can see the inner regions, which is really helpful to visualize what it is that you actually did. Now, if you had neurons traced in here, markers placed, you would see those as well. And those would come up as trees and markers. Now, under the View tab, you can select different views. You can also set a certain view and save that. So if you want to load in a number of, of tracing reconstructions and have them all displayed at the same angle, you can easily do that, which is kind of handy. Rotation, let me view this in a normal way, and then let me zoom in. Um, under rotation, you can select auto rotate, adjust the speed of the rotation and the angle. So a little tip, when you're making movies, keep the speed down. 
And also keep the angle relatively straightforward. Um, if you do a lot of crazy angle changes, people will get nauseous and they won't like your movies. Mm -mm. So simple is always better. Now under our settings tabs, we can save all of the settings we just did. So the transparency settings, um, the angle settings, this glossiness that I have displayed. I can save all of that so the next reconstruction I load in, whether it's this one or the control animal, I can get to this spot in a snap. Now under my rendering options, we default enable the perspective projection in the fa fast transparency blend. The projection really is just displaying objects that converge to a vanishing point so it looks the way you would expect it to look. Fast transparency blend actually renders translucent objects from front to back until it detects no more objects to render. This does result in a more accurate transparency blend if you have overlapping objects, which in this situation we do. So I tend to leave these enabled. Embed tracing an image is something you can do if you had a dendrite and you wanted to embed it into the image data. You can choose to display the frame rate and that will pop up in the bottom left-hand screen. Um, you can also change the color. We have this new cool feature which is for 3D viewing. And so we had this at SFN last year. We'll have it again at our booth. But this will allow you to see the reconstruction in 3D. So if this was a neuron, you could basically look like you're traveling along the dendrite or the axon. And so we'll have it again. So if you want to see with the 3D glasses and 3D monitor, come by our booth and you can see these, these cool reconstructions in 3D. Obviously, you need to have special hardware for that to work. I okay. think that's really cool. It does <laughs> make me a little ill. But, yeah. but yeah, you know, crawling around, along the dendrite is really pretty neat. Yeah. And so now we're going to open up that um, spine data. Make sure we open up the image data with it. And we're going to open this up in our 3D solids. Uh, sorry, tools, 3D viz, or visualization. I'm going to zoom in before I forget. What we see here is when we first load it in, we show you a slice view. And what the slice view does is it just displays one single image plane. I, I think it's the middle. It's the middle, yep. Yeah. I could do X, Y. And so you can step through a slice. And the reason we display it initially with the slice view is just to keep the size, um, the, to make it zippy when it loads. But for this, I do want to display the full image data. So let's show the full image data. And here now I can set my display options. I can do a max projection, a min projection, and an alpha composite. Max is for fluorescent, min is for bright field. Alpha does a bit more detail in terms of 3D, so it adds a bit more depth. So you can use this option if you feel the min or the max isn't up to what, what you want to see. Now this option for GPU rendering means that we're using a special graphics card. It's a gaming card, so for those of you who like you know, Call of Duty, <laughs> this is for you. World of Warcraft. <laughs> I used to say Doom, but that aged me. But <laughs> the GPU rendering is a graphics processing unit. And that means it's a separate processing unit on the card, and it allows the rendering to be smooth with the image data and to be fast. So if you do have an older computer, you might want to, ch and you're having issues with this 3D visualization, contact us and we can check your graphics card. All the computers that, that we provide with our software will be, are sent with a graphics card that has a graphics processing unit. Yep, the most up-to-date at the time that you purchase. Yes, exactly. You can also adjust the brightness and the contrast. Um, within this image, I can also adjust the transparency. I could do a simple transparency, which is going to make the image go away, or I could do intensity-based, and that's going to give you a bit finer control. So I could adjust the dark, mid-ranges, and bright. And so I can make the dark more transparent so the background goes away and the, the, the staining pops. I can now go to my tracing data, and I can look at my trees. So oh, one, one thing I just wanted to point out about um, the image data. So if, in this case, you've got a single channel image. But if you have multi-channel image data, whatever you have displayed in the standard tracing view, um, any adjustments you make, um, which channels you're viewing at that time, that's what you're going to see when you go into 3D visualization. So if you've got a three-channel image, but you want to make a movie of only two of the channels, just disable the channel that you don't want included before you start 3D visualization. Okay, excellent. So under our tracing tab, 
we're going to do a surface reconstruction, just like we did for the contours. And we have our reconstruction. So we've put our tracing um, over the image data. And so here, now I can show my texture. So I can load in a pattern, and I can make this look fancier. Again, I'm old school. Everyone laughs, but I prefer, I don't prefer, I don't like this. But if you do like it, you could put it on. <laughs> um, you can also choose to display the spine data, or you can turn it off. The texture is really cool when you're doing the 3D. That's um, true. It, it does work if you're doing that, that 3D yeah. movies. So you just got to get with the time. I know. I'm old, I guess. So now if we go, we can also adjust the transparency of the tracing, as you see here. And we can bring it back. If I want to hide the tracing, I can just turn off the tree. And it's going to hide both the dendrite as well as all the spines that were traced. So now I can save this. If I get to a view that I like, I can click on the diskette, and I can save an image, a movie, or a 3D model. Now in terms of the image, you can actually save this at a higher resolution or magnification if you want to try to get this view into a journal cover. And so we have a lot of our users have actually exported their uh, 3D visualization data into journal covers, which is always really cool. Let us know when you have a journal cover or you have great images. We'd love to see what you've done with your data using our software. I think it's fabulous. Um, then a movie, we can record as an AVI movie. We can record, and this is what I recommend for putting into presentations. It's really easy to get an AVI into PowerPoint and get it to work properly and seamlessly. Nothing is as bad as having a presentation and the movie doesn't work. The 3D model, we support formats such as VRML and OBJ, and this is to load these movies into a third-party program like Blender to do more manipulations. So you have all of those options. Now I'm just going to quickly make a movie and then we'll, we'll um, show you the movie in the next example. But if I want to make a movie, I like to click on the film strip. But before I do that, if I want the movie to rotate, I'll enable my auto rotation. And then I can go ahead and launch the movie. And so once I hit save, it's going to start recording. So make sure you're at a spot that you like and now it's recording. So if I want to zoom in, and that right-click menu won't show up, but if I want to zoom in, I'm just going to drag the mouse away from me. Now you need to be smooth, so you have to have a lot of real estate so your mouse doesn't get hung up on your desk. Mm. And now I can go to my tracing tab, turn the spines off, turn them back on. If I want to zoom out, just pull the mouse away, f uh, t sorry, towards me. Again, you're going to have to practice a little bit to be smooth. Too much coffee, it's probably not going to work. When you're done, you can just stop recording the movie, and it's going to render. So you can set the compression you want. Um, I usually do Microsoft Video 1, and I don't typically compress. But if this is a very big movie, and these can get pretty big, you might want to play with the compression. OK, and so now let's switch back to um, our presentation just to show you a movie that I made in the software. And so this is the similar data file in image data. This is a movie I made, uh, I guess, last week. And so I'm zooming in, I'm going to turn the spine information off and then turn it back in, on, and then zoom out. If I want to remove the tree, I just uncheck, uncheck the tree option next to um, you Next can also um, turn on and off the, the bounding box, which are those white lines there. Mm -hmm. So if you want this to appear just in space, then you, you don't do need that. to specify where the volume is that you're rendering. Exactly. And you also can, off, can turn off the image data, too. And so now in summary, we reviewed how to work with images only, traces only, and images with tracing in Neurolucida. Stair Investigator and Neurolucida Explorer. So we talked about image adjustment, image sizes, scale bars, annotations and cropping, changing the tracing displays, generating screenshots and exporting traces, working with virtual images, and the 3D visualization. And so to finish up, we're going to be at SFN, as I said. So please stop by our booth um, and say hi. We always like to meet researchers using our software. And you can put the 3D glasses on and yep. see that 3D visualization. Thank you guys very much. It was a pleasure. And, and thanks to everybody who attended today. Um, all of these cool tools are made possible by our, our programmers, staff, and our staff scientists like ourselves, as well as the people who are using our software and letting us know what they need to create the data that they represent for their experimental paradigm. And so we really appreciate 
the collaborative nature that we have with our customers, we think it's great. And we would like to encourage you to contact us, not just with questions and concerns, but um, ideas and options for improvements as well. So we appreciate that and we like that. Not only that, but um, we're fortunate to receive NIH um, grants for this new research that we're doing to automatically trace neurons, dendrites, synapses, uh, to create these extremely large image data w using virtual slides, and then all of the analyses that are then permissible on these very large formats. If you're thinking about Clarity, for example, if you're using trying out Clarity, the virtual images and what we can do with these very large image files is going to be very relevant for you. Um, and that is uh, made with support from the NIMH, and we're very grateful for that. You know how to find us. You were able to log on today. So if you <laughs> want any help or you want a free trial, you can contact us um, at any point. We also have a number of videos available on YouTube. They include everything from product demos to uh, tips and tricks and uh, where the webinars are, are hosted. So after the fact, you can come back and watch us again. So we appreciate your time and attention. And any question that we did not answer during the webinar will be answered. So um, please, don't, please don't worry. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Have a great afternoon. Take care.